So good morning everyone. Good morning. We know that uh, the, the language of the Bible, apart from it being transmitted through, uh, through language, which is expressed by uh, letters, which form words and sentences, we see all the way through the Bible the significance also of numbers. Um, I'd like to explain this according to the Pasuk that we say, Marama Masech Hashem, how great and how many are all your creations. How deep are your thoughts? And we also know that the word machshava is connected with cheshbon, making reckoning, which you tend to do in forms of number. Because anyone who studies the basis of physical science knows that it's closely connected with mathematics, with equations. You wouldn't these days find any deeper uh, scientific work on what's going on in the world without making use of numbers. So we find just like this is so in the works of Hashem, it's also so in the words of Hashem. Then the numbers have a significance. And we have spoken about the concept of the seven days of creation six days with the combination of the Shabbat. Then we have the ten Mamarim, because in the act of creation there are also ten times when Hashem expresses a certain intention which then becomes actualized. And then we have the Selet Adibrot, the Decalogue. And we have explained the ten Makot are the means whereby what it exists in the divine nature of creation, it also exists in the pattern which is from the divine soul for creating harmony <coughs> for human beings. Now if we look carefully at the Esa Makot as we've been doing, and I want to thank all of you who have uh, listened and also asked you questions the last few weeks. And especially this year, I've, I've found a new insight, to some extent, to me the new insight. The addition to there being a division of ten, which we discussed, the first five, the second five, the heart and the heart follow, and we know each play became more severe than the other. At the end of Pasha Vaeva, we come to the end of the seven plagues. And the seventh one was the plague of hail. And we find that the hail made such enormous amount of destruction but there was a certain element mentioned there with regard to the Egyptian people. It says, Hayare me'abde Hashem, anyone who expressed by this time amongst all the servants of Paro an inkling of the fear of God, Abudir Chamayim means they really thought that God rules the world and we've been doing wrong. What did they do? Hayadis. It made clear that he put all his people and all his cattle into the houses where they'd be protected from the deathly hail, because it's not ordinary hail, it was a hail, intermingled with fire. And whatever it touched got killed, human beings, cattle, and so on. And it had an effect. 
What effect did it have? Pharaoh said, Hashem at the end of Passover era. Hashem is the one who is right. I and my people, we have been wicked. And therefore he says to Moshe, please pray to Hashem. I recognize he's the ruler. It is the Shuba. But and there it's very interesting, although we see in the last in the last um, plagues, the last five plagues, there was Hashem who had this heart. We discussed that previously. But by the by the end of the seventh plague it doesn't say that. Why? Because Parati Teshuva. But what happened? He pleaded so much to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, Moshe pleaded to Hashem to look to Dan Teshuva. Let whatever's left of Egypt, let them live. Because your purpose was to bring them to Teshuva. He also recognizes that those who are God-fearing, they're being protected. So he also has become God-fearing. But what happened? It says he hardened his own heart when he stopped. Hashem forgave him, and um, as a result, so what does it say at the beginning of Pasha Bo? It says, Pasha Bo, it says, if we look at the last verse of Pasha Vaero here on page 73, it says that Paro saw that the rain and this deathly hail had stopped as well as the enormous thunder, came with huge thunder. He continued to sin, and he said, he hardened his heart. He and most of his servants accepted the Yareh Tashem. It says even, Yaved, and he hardened his heart so much, he was not ready to fulfill the demand of Hashem in all the mouth of Moshe, to let the people go and serve Hashem. So, He's the example of someone who says, I do Teshuva. Okay, I'm going to do Teshuva. He does Teshuva. But when the punishments and the difficulties go away, he has a relapse. So that's why it says, the beginning of Pashat Bo. Here we have the last three deathly legs. So it said, now, so, but what, how, does, how does Hashem start? Vayom Hashem Moshe, go to Paro, he even said this hint, boys, the three, three last prayers, because, I'm, it will go straight to the second verse. Okay, he's not listening, he's changed his mind again. I want you to say this in the ears of your children, your grandchildren. Eight Hashem, Lati Mitzrayim all the signs which I've shown in Egypt, and then you, this reference to Amisro, you will know that I'm Hashem. It means the purpose of the Esa Makot is not just for Egypt, it's not just for all the successors of the Peros, the maniacal rulers who think that they are like God, they can do what they want. No, it's for the people of Israel. We have to learn from it. And that's why it says, this is, this is the introduction of the last three plagues, and it says this special lesson for Amisra, for us. So, it says, so what, what is the next plague? Next, the first, first deathly plague is the plague of locusts. Now, plagues of locusts, well, no, happens. But, to understand this, we have to see what the Bible tells us about locusts and also what has happened in history until the day of the locusts, which is amazing. Because the locusts, they don't have, as we find in other insects, some form of social organism with a, with a, queen, a, 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 a bee queen yeah. No, they have no ruler. But when they come out of the initial state, initial state is like other insects, they come out in cuticle, and they come out in a new manner, and then they get together in groups, and from the groups they create an army. 
an army which is so enormous, they have millions coming in one go. And they come in such a manner, like an army, they don't get in, in one another's way, and they're very most unusual things in Pana Lucas. Since also we've got the good fortune of the Yeshiva of having had many forms of investigation into descriptions of what goes on in the world and how it's related in the Torah. So uh, there's a book which was uh, worked upon by one of our students some years ago concerning locusts. If there's some locusts that miss of the food, went into all the aspects of it, one of the most modern discoveries. So first, before it goes to this more thoroughly, what has come to me is a bit of a deep understanding which I haven't seen brought together. I'll just tell you, we know that this, the eighth plague, the last three, seem to have a specific significance. And this fits in with the pattern of seven. Seven and three is a clear division of the, of the plagues. The plague here is called Arabe, on account of the enormous increase of the tiny insect, which becomes a swarm of billions of crop destroyers under invisible direction from above. Uh, however, no dead Arabe, so the food remained from, from the one, from this plague. This caused Pharaoh, together with wise men of science and magicians, to be forced to recognize the supernatural power of God and is a lesson for the future of the people of Israel. Now, this plague, a similar one, occurred in the time of the prophet Joel. It's assumed generally that this was in the time of Elisha, in the time of the son of Ahab, the king of the northern kingdom, where, they, where Elisha decreed there's going to be a famine, and then a famine for four years, now afterwards a drought for three years. And the assumption, because the people they worship Baal instead of worshiping Hashem, so unless they would change, because Ahab and his, 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 his successor, his son, they just persecuted and even put a death sentence on the prophets of Hashem. And the general assumption is that one studies this prophet Joel, that the famine was caused because of an enormous plague of locusts. And that's described in the prophecy of Joel. First two chapters, they describe the army of, the, there the four different types of locusts mentioned, they're called Chel Hashem, they're the army of God which was sent to arouse Israel to fast and pray and penitence. It says there, look it up, chapter 2, Like men of war, they march, do not break their ranks, nor do they push one another. So he said, today science is investigating, you know, how to avoid collisions and congested traffic on the roads and the air by studying the locusts. And here, that's, that's how he learned it. I mean, there's a big problem to take congestion. On the roads, we know it, and in the air, it's also well known. It's a serious danger to increase the flag in the air. But you can learn from the billions of locusts that come in one swarm and go from one place to another in an organized fashion. So, uh, to explain this a bit more deeply, a hundred years ago, before Pesach, in uh, 1915, there was a massive locust plague in Ellis Israel. Described similar words as in Yuel's prophecy, which did lead Jews to fast and pray and penitence. It's very interesting that that 
plague of locusts that came near Yerushalayim did not enter the old city. And we have many instances of this, things of this nature. There's the, even of the plague of locusts which exists in Egypt, and it says there wasn't another one before, another one after. So, Rabbeinu Hanan in this part, 3,000 years later, in the time of the Gornim, <coughs> he lived in the year, it's called the year 900, after the Common Era, and he said, it's well known in all Egypt, since then there hasn't been a plague of locusts of that dimension, as it's described of the plague of locusts which struck the Egyptians. At that time, of course, was shortly after, but anyway, there weren't many of the original Egyptian families left and taken over, or, or taken over already by Semites. But in any case, this was a very fascinating aspect of the locusts. Then we find in the Shemitah, which took place in the year Tovshinu Tet, let's go back uh, 60 years. So there was, there was, in the Shemitah, there was also a plague of locusts. There was a one village called Komamiot, where they kept the laws of Shemitah 100%. And all around, there were fields where the Shemitah was not observed. And it's interesting, it says in the Chumash, at the end of Ayikra, if you keep the Shmitot, you keep the Torah, and specifically mentions Shmitot also, then you will keep it, then there won't be a Galut. If you don't keep it, you'll see that your land will become desolate. And then it also mentions the plague of locusts will make your land desolate. So in that Shmitah, 60 years ago, there was, there was a plague of locusts and it took away all the crops in the area where they had this village where they kept the Shemitah. As soon as it came to the borders where they kept the Shemitah, the locusts turned back. And then I found also, that I really found about last week, that there's an island called Jerba, where there are a lot of religious Jews near Tunisia, and um, they kept every aspect of Torah. And uh, the head of the non-Jewish, it's like a king, at least he was the prime minister, of Java, there was a plague of locusts which was taking away all the crops. As they do, they take, they denude. Anywhere where there are plants, anywhere there's food, denude. So there's a description there, they found a document signed by the heads of the court, the leading rabbis of Java. And they sign, they say, we hereby give testimony of what happened. The head of the city, the private of the whole island, he came and he said, there's a plague of locusts. Everyone is obligated to help us destroy them. Otherwise, there'll be no food left, there'll be a famine here. Where they're taking up, they're eating up everything, wherever they can find food. They also enter the store barns, they go to the house as well. So everybody has got to help. And this was get near, near the end of the week. And the Jews were to cooperate. They came round to the synagogues and said, collect everyone, collect everyone together and make sure that everybody helps. But if not, it's going to be a fatal situation for us. This happened, this happened 150 years ago. So when he came there to Shabbos, 
they said, they pleaded, they said, look, we, we've never, we never desecrate the Shabbos. So, please, please, will you, please, the first they pleaded with the head, he said, no, if you don't, if you're not going to work, even on Shabbat, it's dangerous, we'll have to, have to imprison you, to make it, to force you. So they got together in the synagogue and they prayed to Hashem, please Hashem help us. We don't want to desecrate your Shabbos. What happened? When it came to the time of Shabbos, the plague stopped. The, the locusts went away. Chil Hashem. Unbelievable. And in the Shemitah, in fact, in the, what they called it, in the Shemitah, which happened 60 years ago, the people didn't, it would appear that Hashem acted, there was a traffic director telling them where to go. So, it's like this. I'm going back now to the book of Yoel. The, if you read the description, the first two chapters of Yoel, it describes a complete devastation of the land. We can understand on that basis what it says in the Book of Kings of the terrors of the famine. And that's, that's, if you look most of the commentaries, and that's what it was. But the Abhavanel gives a different interpretation. If one, you know, you heard it from Yitzhak Abhavanel, a fantastic personality. With the finance minister by Ferdinand and Is Isabella. So he was not just the leader of the Jews, he was a great scholar, a wealthy man. And he became the finance minister for the king and queen at the time of the Inquisition. And then, of course, they had made it difficult when the Inquisition started. They said, we've got to banish all the Jews. All the Jews had to be banished. And he also, he led the exile in the year 1492, significant years, you know, that year when Columbus, some say, was Jew, discovered America. All the Jews left in Spain either had to convert to Christianity or they had to leave. They all left, and he also left with them. He landed up in a situation where he became, lost all his possessions, he was by himself. So he said, those of you who understand this phrase, he said, now I've got nothing, but I've got something in this place. I've got time. Not that. I'm not in a proper Jewish community. I'm an individual in some place where he found himself. The elephant is in Italy somewhere. He said, but I can find some for him. And he wrote his fantastic commentaries on the, on the Chumash and the Prophets. So these fantastic commentaries. So he says like this, this terrible famine which came from the enormous plague of locusts, so it's very interesting that the book of Yorah has got two parts. First it describes this play, and then it describes the laws of Gog and Magog. What's going to happen in the future, before the Mashiach comes, which is described in other books of the prophets, and which today we don't have to read from the prophets because we read from contemporary history. It's going on. Gog and Magog is 70, the 70 nations, the 70 wolves, and this is Israel. Well, we're experiencing it today in different ways, unfortunately. We have done the last 100, 100 years in, in a, more the literal fashion how it's described by the prophets, what will happen. And also in the second part of the Book of Yoel. So therefore, some to put it this way, why, why are these two parts of the same book of your first, first describes the terrible results of the enormous plague of your locust, which comes in such swarms. So, the last two chapters, 
the mention the words of Koko Magog, like in Yechezkel, like the Chaya, surrounding the land of Israel, culminating in the Messianic redemption. And parallel terms are used in the first two chapters concerning the Devastic Locust Plague and the last two chapters. There's a comparison between them. You see, it's the same authors. There are some commentators say first two chapters deal with the events of the first temple period, as I described in the time of Elisha, in which case there seems to be no connection. No connection. <coughs> At the last chapters, oh yeah, between the first and the other, Abab and others say the locust plague in the legary for the destruction will take place in the walls of Gog and Magog to rouse Israel to Tshuva to bring the redemption. So I want to say they're both true. That it's, it's so literal what it says in Joel concerning the locust. It's described in such detail that it was actually witnessed how it happened. So it happened in the time of Elisha. Why? Because there was an opportunity for Amisro to do to and they didn't. They didn't listen. So what happened to them in the end, the ten tribes? The whole kingdom, northern kingdom, disappeared, was attacked by Sancheri, and they were completely destroyed by the army of Sancheri. In the army of here, it had an army of, of 180,000 very strong soldiers. See? And uh, they devastated the land. But this was like a warning. What might even happen to the rest of the first kingdom, even though the southern tribes. Since Amkhedu came to besiege Yerushalayim, it was Chizkiah was the king of Yehuda and about Teshuva and he made a Teshuva movement for the whole nation so on one night it happened that the whole army of Sancheder were annihilated from plague but so Abhavanel says that the wars of Gog and Magog I would I even mean, want to say it's both. This happened, but it also, since there's a certain aspect, if you study Chumash more deeply, what happened to the forefathers is a premonition of what might happen to the children. And it's at various stages, just like explained in the course of the past children. All the rebukes and the curses on the people of Israel became fulfilled, it was interpreted as a fulfillment of the first exile, as a fulfillment of the second exile. But it's only today that we know it also mentions the fulfillment in a more literal fashion than was ever thought. And by some of them, some of the, some of the curses you say, well, it's, it's metaphor, it's an allegory. No, it becomes actual reality, as, I, as I've shown you, for example, that the final terrible suffering coming to me is the Holocaust, which is the last verse of all the curses. It's after the Holocaust, we can expect the redemption to come soon. But the next part tells us about how to do Teshuvah. In the end, Amish will be forced to do Teshuvah. And so therefore, the prophecy of the Holocaust is there. It's there in the first vision. Even the first vision given to Abraham Avinu, as I showed you this week. It's, it's, but it's shown also at the end of the Tchokho. Similarly, also the prophet Joel. Joel is speaking about his time. He's also speaking about our time, the wars of Kokomako. And perhaps in some ways, the way in which the nuclear omnicost is described see today the description of what might happen if we let the evildoers start spreading they've started already chemical weapons we will see mass destruction not only in the, in, 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 the, in the Holocaust but in the Arab Wars they're using chemical weapons 
if it goes a bit further, it will be like devastation of locusts. They'll come like in, in a quick way. If you, read, if you read the enormous damage, relatively speaking, by tons and tons of locusts coming in one swarm, means billions of them in one go, and devouring every living, be living thing in the plant world, and all food and everything disappears. In a short time, then they go somewhere else, all of a sudden. So, let's hope, let's hope we'll take the lesson and we'll do the show, so it won't happen. So this is, let's go back. This is why, why, why does Hashem say, so important for the people of Israel, I'm going to bring the locusts on Egypt, which is like death. Because it means complete, there's no food, no food for the animals, and no food for the humans. The animals will die, the humans will die. What will be left? Even the, even the plants won't grow again, many of them. So that's, so that's why also Paro, please, please take away from me, take this death away from me. Because it means death. Also, even in, in, in very severe, in very severe attacks, they start blinding. They also have, they, they, in some way, they blind. They've got a spray to blind up, up with the bones. So they, they, they go and blind people, come blind. So this is, and, and destroy everything. So this is the important message for us today to take from the the, uh, the, if you want to have some idea of um, of the <coughs> I'll read you here from this booklet which will soon come out in English it's, uh, it's, uh, it's done with some students at Tanel which really comes to every day not to Shiva. And um, the we can find that Ababana goes further, he says that the four different species of locusts which are mentioned in the prophecy of Yoro, <coughs> so it says <coughs> that this reference to the four empires that have subjugated and tried to annihilate the people of Israel. That's why there are four different types of grasshoppers. The prophet emphasized the priest's mourning of the plague of locusts, even though the common folk suffer from it more by the first destruction of the temple. So in Europe, we read that the famine was because of the lack of water in addition to the plague, plague of locusts. So, we say it follows the tremendous numbers of um, of, the, of the locusts mentioned frequently and uh, there's a, there have always been proofs the land of Israel is like the navel of the world. It's known as the land acute, of acute natural opposites where climates and continents meet. We know also this is where, where all the birds of the world meet. Our land of all lands is where many plants reach the most northern, southern, eastern, western loca localities. The same is true for animals. Regarding insects, the land has many different types. <coughs> Nowadays, there are 100, 200 types of grasshoppers. In the past, we just said there were 800 types in the land of Israel. Locusts as a mass phenomenon are enormous. 50 million grasshoppers cover one square kilometer. Each individual locust weighs over two grams, but this adds up 
to a good number of tons per square kilometer of creatures. A car, for example, weighs about 800 kilograms. And here, the band of locusts in air can have 100 million grasshoppers weighing 200,000 tons and occupy an area of 2,000 square kilometers. Every grasshopper can eat half its weight in green grass each day. The entire pack can destroy 100,000 tons of green growth every day. That's it. So this is, uh, this is the situation. And in this book, which is going to be produced soon, there's a description of many different aspects of the grasshoppers. Most of them are hinted at in these accounts in the Bible. And then there's a special type where the, the one can eat them. In fact, it, it, it contains a high amount of protein without fat. And that's why it's recommended by some people situations. So this is also therefore the explanation of the last three plagues because they're all like death plagues. Because Pharaoh went through a relapse. And this is connected with the concept of the Rambam who says and this explains many of the deeper aspects which we've been discussing that Pharaoh is the personification of the evil inclination which attacks human beings, it takes away the divine image. And uh, the, really the, the classical example of this is there is a certain parallel to be found in the law, unusual law of the table. What do we find here? That the warnings and even the sufferings, the makot, makot which means the plagues, like lashes came against power in Egyptians, three times three times three, finalizing in makot b'chorot or even according to the way we describe it, seven. And then if you relapse, without the shuva, seven, very good. Without the shuva, you have to keep to it. So there's a law later in Sefer Tavarim concerning the rebellious son, which according to uh, a basic opinion of the Gomorrah, never happened, never will happen. Why? Because we see the boy beginning of teenage, so he starts rebelling against his parents. <coughs> he says his ego starts working inside himself. Together, sometimes the ego means beforehand he didn't have, to have really the ability to think things through himself. So whatever he thought, whatever he did, was more or less as a result of his environment or his initial constitution. But when he feels, I've got my own personality, it's starting to grow up, that's when we say the Eight Sahara is the material person. As a child growing up, as far as he's concerned, He's following his instincts, but part of his instincts are, are, are not yet so much a part of his personality. It's what he was born with. It's not his own inner essence. He was born with this and had an environment. Parents and teachers, and sometimes he could agree with them, sometimes not, but he recognized to some extent the authority of others and thought to others. When he, when he begins to feel na'a means he's waking up inside. The heat na'a means to wake up, not to rouse oneself. It also means to rebel. So 
It's a certain spiritual rebellion that comes. I feel I've got my own personality. And I also feel there's now the stronger power of sexuality, which takes over the person and says, right, you're here to enjoy yourself. Your parents or your environment tells you something you have to live with. No, I'll, I'll, really, I'll do what I want. I'll do what my instincts tell me. And now I can make decisions myself what to do. So he becomes rebellious. And let's say he becomes someone who just eats whatever he wants and takes food even if it's not his. And from eating goes also to other forms of enjoyment. That's what these people are straight. Frequently, the turmoil of adolescence, unless they're given good guidance. So it says, the parents have to speak with one voice, otherwise there's no love in the The parents have to try to improve him. They can't do it. Then they're allowed to take the boy to a court. Maybe he's already like a juvenile delinquent. Have to get to have to have for probation, take him to a court. Now, technically speaking, the law is we throw it on. So it says, when such a such a youngster is brought by the parents to the court, and both parents have worked together, not to have a different points of view. If that different points of view, we say, okay, the boy is in trouble because he's getting contradictory messages from the parents that will never work. They have to work with one girl, speak with one voice. <clears throat> and then, if he still doesn't listen to parents, then what's going to happen is he's going to grow up a big criminal and become, and become a, a hijacker, and become a murderer, because he want to take whatever he thinks, whatever he can find, brings him pleasure, it's his. So then they have to give him chastisement. How do they do it? They give him a warning three times. He says three times three. It says in the mission of Mora, it's a paragon, but Sora Mora has to be given a warning just like Hashem gave warning to Paro. So it's very interesting that one of the best works on Torah pedagogics, which is the Torah's method of education, was developed by Rav Hirsch in his essays from the laws of Ben Sora Amora. Because it says, it's clear from the Gemara, the main view seems to be it never happened, never will happen. Gemara is el but you've got to learn from it. In other words, the whole law of the, the <coughs> Ben Sora Amora is to teach the significance of parent, parental education, and if not, education by others. How you got to deal with adolescent rebellion in the right manner. How to lead, how, how to drop people and adolescents from becoming drug addicts or alcoholics or compulsive gamblers. It can be done. You follow the way of the Torah. But the Torah gives us the extreme case, which never happened, never will happen. Because, generally speaking, there are parental problems. The father and mother didn't speak with one voice, didn't use right methods. But the teaching is that what happened to Paro and in the Egypt can happen throughout society and will also happen in the time of Melchemet Gog and Magog. How Hashem deals with nations who will not recognize the truth of the message of the people of Israel and the message of prophecy of the Ten Commandments. But it's also a message to each individual how to deal with the Yetzara. So the, you see it here in the family structure, you see it by the Pensora Amora, who one of the commentators gave the hint. You want to know what the drash is. The drash is the same way as we find the tzachatash be'achav. If you, in, in the end, this person will only be able to live if he, if he takes the warnings and the punishment seriously. Because also the series, the three times three, is in fact mentioned in Prophet Amos says, 
for three for three for the threefold sins, okay, if you do the show, I forgive you. But if you have a relapse, if you before you go to the next series, I will punish you. Because that's how it works. The third one, if you don't listen, then comes another series, it goes on. Three times three. And if you don't listen up to three times three times, or met Kolbachov, then in the end, your the, the, the pattern of your life, the Cambrian, even the individual, will disappear. The sage says the same person does sins. He does them once or twice. After twice they're already permissible. After three times, more difficult. If, he, if Hashem gives people chances again and again and again, also giving warnings, gives warnings through suffering difficulties. If you don't take notice of the warning, then ultimately it's the end. So make sure you go and do teshuva already the first time, and if not, at least the third time. And that way, we, that also explains why the Rambam, who is the top of the week, work says, power is also a mashal for the power of the Yitzhara, not to overcome it, that he's also the one who uses this as the opportunity to explain the relationship <coughs> between freedom of choice to be a saint or to be a sinner. And that applies to each one of us in different circumstances. So let's hope we'll all take this lesson with us and, uh, <coughs> and help, to help us, as it says, to recognize Hashem.